We just did that. We did that, we did that together. That was the greatest thing I've ever been with. <laughs> We have with us the legendary improviser, Wendy McClendon Covey, and we are so honored and really happy that you're with us here today. This is just amazing to be talking with you on this beautiful day. Well, thanks for asking me, and I, I love the whole story of how you guys came to be, and listen, I gotta tell you, I've, I've used my improv education more than my college education, so <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I mean, it's a, it's a really a beautiful skill, and that's what this whole conversation is going to be about, is just improvisation and how it's changed your life. In so many ways, we know it has, because we love watching you do it as fans of your work. So I just will start with the reason we met. You said I asked you to, and I, I've been listening to a lot of your other podcasts and things you've done. and. It's something you said to on um, with Dax Shepard was, you know, no one wants dessert until you parade the dessert around the room. You have to bring the dessert out and put yourself out there for people to know it exists. And to, to when you said that, I was reminded of me, you know, putting myself out there as a COVID production assistant, saying, I'm going to take a risk and just say, Wendy, you need to know about this improv troupe. And here we are today, and it's dreams becoming reality. And I, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on that, and like, what, how can you advise us to all put ourselves out there and be proud of the dessert we all have within us? Well, that's that's kind of um, you know a dumb little story that I tell, but it applies to all areas of your life. Like, don't just sit around and wait for things to come knocking on your door because guess what? Nothing's ever going to. Mm -hmm. You have to go out and be the magnet. And it really is true, at least in, in this business. <laughs> Again, no one knows what they're looking for until you show it to them. And that's the same with any area of sales. And it's, it's the same with you know people who meet their true love. They've got this list of what they think it is. But then they meet somebody else and it blows them all away. Yeah. Blows, uh, blows away all those expectations. So get out there and be easy to find. And That's, you will start attracting what's yours. But it's not going to happen if you're just going to be a basic shy person and not go for what you want. You know, do you want to sit around talking about your anxiety and how that kept you from doing things? boring <laughs> yeah you're so right it's a it's a choice in life you know your your thoughts become you and whatever you're focused on if you're focused on your anxiety and your negative you know emotions and things they'll just keep coming you'll become addicted to them and you know i, I heard you talking also with alec mapa on hot mess you know a, a therapist i really dive deep you know and say i love it i love it yeah, I mean, I, I just was was listening and, and how you say, what are you getting out of this state? You know, you're talking about in life, whatever you're, you're in this state of mind, what are you actually getting out of it? Because you're always getting something, right? And even if it's a negative. And I just wondered, what do you get out of the state of doing improv? You know, and what is the therapeutic value of this art form? Well, you know, when I was... Coming up, um, my I lived with my parents for a long time, and they were not thrilled at all with me becoming an actress. They hated the idea. So for many years, I was lost. I did not know what I was trying to do. I would go to school and then drop out, you know, take dumb jobs, and, you know, nothing was lighting me up, and I was depressed all the time. But I would try to sneak off to auditions. But I didn't know what I was doing and no one around me knew what they were doing. So I would sneak up to LA and sometimes I'd get so nervous about an audition that I'd just drive right past it, you know, and waste my whole day. Um, but I got married at 26 and my husband said, well, why don't you just try it? I think you can do it. Why don't you know, do it, just try. So my best friend that I was working with at the time at this horrible little Ramada Inn near Disneyland, 
we decided, okay, we're going to go to the groundlings. We're going to take class there because we had seen a show and it was like, oh my God, my mind is blown. If I could get up there and play characters and learn how to improvise, I would feel like a wizard. I've got to try this. So we started taking class at the groundlings and it really made me overcome my shyness. It really made me, I hate to use this phrase, but I don't know how else to say it. It made me less afraid of like taking up space in a situation. Like I got something to say and what I have to say is not stupid, you know? Yeah. Maybe it's not the funniest thing, mm. but I can add information to a scene and help somebody else. I can add building blocks mm -hmm. to this. I'm useful in this situation. So I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to keep going until they tell me to stop because that's how the groundlings is like mm -hmm. keep going. And when there's nothing there for you anymore, you get the boot. Mm. Well, I never got the boot <laughs> and I stayed in the company for seven years. But by that, by the time I got into the company, I was working so much that I didn't get to do as many shows as I wanted, but boo hoo, like that's a terrible thing. <laughs> but yeah, so it, it really, um, helped me it gave me the confidence to uh talk to people yeah, yeah. That makes sense. it does make perfect sense because yeah. that's i always call it a shell opener you know and it's like that's it just pries open this shell that the world puts around you you know we're all put inside this shell of like you can't sing or dance or be funny or whatever you're just just go work the rest of your life away at some hotel outside of Disneyland. <laughs> and then you have to peel it open and, and do it. And I, I really appreciate hearing your story because I, I too have worked my fair share of hotel gigs. And I know this crew of amazing actors has all juggling it. And there's a lot of actors who couldn't make it today because they're either doing background gigs in the Hudson Valley or they're working. Uh, we have someone who works in hospital um, who send in some questions, but I wanted to open the floor up to this amazing room and just have this them introduce yourselves and just say when you got your itch of what happened while you got into this world and you know just talk we'll open it up to the floor a little bit and, and if you have a question you can ask too. You do okay, hey, Wendy. Thank you so much for doing this. My name is Mac. Um, my my itch was received. Uh, Second grade, uh, uh, Billy, Billy Goat Gruff. I was cast as, as, the, as the main Billy Goat. Okay. Powerful piece. <laughs> yeah. Jack and the Beanstalk next year. I just I couldn't get, get enough of it. Um, I had a question in that period you're talking about when you're first going to the Groundlings. Um, was there a point where you uh, started maybe like your own D? DIY project with friends or something? Were you like generating content on your own, like without a school or anything to tell you, you know, yes. what to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I remember when I was in the program at the Groundlings and back then it was so impacted that there were waiting lists and there were, I mean, years could go by between your first and second classes. So I had gone through um, like the writer's lab and I was waiting to go into the advanced and last class. And I started venturing out and going to other theaters and taking actual acting, not improv. Mm. Um, and I ended up at a different improv theater just to you know, do sketch and stuff and just keep that muscle active. And I met a girl, we wrote a show together We wrote it, produced it, did all the costumes, did all the casting. And that thing ran for a long time. And that was very gratifying because um, and like we enlisted our husbands to do the sound and the, you know, sell the snacks and stuff. At one point, my in-laws were working the snack bar. Like it was a really homegrown situation. But there were nights when we didn't know anybody in the audience. Hmm. Like, for, you know how it is to pack shows. Like you're always yeah. handing a flyer out to somebody. Like, come to my show, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And after a while, the audience was strangers, total yeah. strangers. And then people started coming back and coming back. 
And then we got booked in another theater. And then we got booked in another theater. It was like, oh my God, I guess we're okay at this. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that was very, um, that was really meaningful to us because, you know, when you don't, don't get stuck just going to one place for your training. Yeah. Yeah. I, LA used to be very myopic in that way like oh are you going to io west mm -hmm. or are you going to second city on melrose the groundlings blah 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 like it was almost like gang warfare with these different improv yeah. theaters <laughs> but when if you're smart you'll go and tr do a little bit of training everywhere mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. You That's know. a great idea. Yeah, there's. I wish there is a lot of resources in the Hudson Valley, and we're always sending them to each other and saying, "Oh, here's something in you know Rhinebeck. Here's here's another Hudson Valley Improv," and that is really good advice. And I think we're really open to um, anybody who wants to come into ours. You know, we are very much resist that kind of clicky nature. No, that's great. Yeah, it's open door policy. Yeah. Open door policy. We did have a nine-year-old with us in our early ages, and it was a it was a challenge. There was a, a lot of a, a different age gap, and I wanted to bring that up because I I saw you doing an improv thing with some younger kids on a stage, you know, online. I, I was like digging, yeah. and it's like kids kids are somehow really good at this. I, I myself have directed a play with kids. But what is it about the child, you know, inside of us that like you're willing to pretend and, and how how can improv help kids, you think, guide them in their life in that same way? Well, the basic thing about improvising is listening and then responding accordingly. OK, and giving yourself permission to play. Well, kids are great at that. But then once they hit teen, when they become teenagers, they get self-conscious. Mm. And then you kind of stay that way for the rest of your life, unless you <laughs> really do the work. <laughs> um, so yeah, kids, kids are great with playing improv games. And I bet if you started just like an all kids workshop, you would be bombarded. Yeah. It's a really good at this. We time. should do as a group, you know, it's a that, it's a beautiful thing to do to, to exchange that. And, you know, second grade is when you got the itch, oh, yeah. you know. So just so you want to pass the mic, anybody else want to tell their, their story and, and ask a question? Hi, Wendy. Thanks so much for um, coming to talk with us tonight. Um, Thank you. Um, honored. Truly. Um, my name is Taylor Chappelle, um, and I, uh, I guess, you know, it's, it's strange. I got the, the I, I didn't really consider it at the time, but uh, when I was probably around eight, um, I did this thing called LARPing. I don't know if you know what that is. <laughs> I know what um, LARPing? LARPing. Yeah. I'm aware, yeah. yes. yes. Um, and so... <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I was one of those kids that ran around with a foam sword and like had these little foam balls and was like, you know, damage, you know, and like casting spells and all that yeah. jazz. And so you had to create this character that was like, you know, a, a person and then you would go into these situations where you, you know, there was no script, there was just a story being told and you had to, you know, portray this character who was you and and so that was really when i started acting i think um and it wasn't until high school that i actually got into like doing stage plays and and doing more theater and you know i went to college and got, you know did some theater stuff i got a theater degree <clears throat> but um uh but uh you know I, uh, so that's really where I got the itch. And then, you know, film film and television has really been a draw for me in terms of a professional career more than theater because um, theater doesn't really pay the bills that much. But um, uh, I guess a question I have is, um, you know, I see all these great actors who, you know, improvise so much. And I come from a place where, uh, a lot of my training is is learning lines and like sticking to cues and things like that. And so for a very long time, I was terrified of improv. 
talks. And I finally took a class in, in college that really opened it up for me. I had a wonderful teacher. Her name is Lauren Bone Noble. She's a wonderful woman. And she really like did little baby steps to like get me to, to go there. But I, I was wondering, I guess my question is, how often is it that you come across a script where they don't give you any dialogue and that you just have to go with it? You know, since my first big job was Reno 911 and there were no scripts mm. for that, literally just a paragraph of what the scene should be, I really had a, a misplaced notion of what it would be like to be on TV, okay? Mm. Um, or what it what it's really like to do an all improvised project because while while there are no scripts for Reno, do you know how much we throw away? How <laughs> much of the improv is not usable because it just doesn't go anywhere? So my feeling after doing this for so long, you have to learn how to do both. And when you have a script, you really have to be aware of like, who's having their moment and what makes the scene work and what takes you into the next scene. Because when people improvise, they don't keep that in mind. Like you have to add information. You can't just, you know what the, the thing is, people always try to get in arguments. Or maybe they don't try to, but they usually end up getting in an argument because everyone's trying to one up each other with the um with the funny stuff and sometimes your job is not to be funny the funny will come out if you're just telling the truth mm, that makes so it. i don't know uh if i'm answering your question at all i i've done plenty of all improv projects but then it turns out to be an editor's game mm. because you have so much material that you have to sift through and then make it make sense. So there was a there was a um, time when Waiting for Guffman came out, where everybody thought that's so funny. We we could all do that. Let's just bring a bunch of funny people together and film it, and we'll get a movie out of it. No, you won't. <laughs> no, you're just going to get a hodgepodge of different punchlines that don't go anywhere. So. You do have to be strategic and at least have a good solid outline when you have an all improv project. Now, I have worked on different projects where the director has told me, say whatever you want Yeah. in this scene. I trust you. I know you're going to say something funny. Just go ahead. But that's only after we get it the scripted way first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. That that's actually that's really enlightening. Thank you. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Question. Yeah, I actually question about Reno nine one one. Like as as the show progressed and it was such a hit, did you find your guys the group's dynamic changed and the way you guys improvised changed at all, or was it always kind of the same? Um, you know, that's an interesting question because that was so long ago, I yeah. barely remember doing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> since we have come back, and I don't know if you knew that. Whoa. But yeah. <laughs> Do you remember an app, a very short-lived app called Quibi that came out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, yeah, I saw I that. Yeah. 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 Surprise, it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. Watching 10 minute television shows on your phone is not what people want to do. Yeah. But we filmed a season seven of that show. It's technically season seven, but you know, we left off with 12 years ago or whenever it ended. Um, those episodes are available to watch now for free on the Roku channel. Wow. Oh man. And there's even a season eight that will come out that we filmed around Halloween of last year during the pandemic. And then there will be a movie that comes out that we start filming in August. All that to say, mm. when I went back into that, I thought, I don't even know if I can play this person anymore. 
right. it's been so long, you know, and I've learned so much. What really brought me back to it was our morning meetings that we would have around the table. All right. Um, that's when I really got back into my groove. Mm-hmm. And I wish we had started with that because that for me was like the grounding of like, oh, now I remember these people. Right. Now I remember now, now this feeling is getting into my body again. Yeah. Um, and I, and I really remembered how um, useless a scene can become the minute somebody says, no, that didn't happen. Right. Oh, no, 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 no. If some, if somebody lays something out first, it happened. You have to stick with it. No matter how stupid it is, that's when it's going to get funny is you saying yes to everything that is already laid out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It shows, it shows them that we don't know one. Um, anyway. cool. <laughs> yes, watch it on the Roku channel. We yeah, will. Oh, I will. I, 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 I had no idea. <laughs> Somebody back here want to tell their story? Here, you know, give it, ask a question. Hi, uh, I'm Zach. Hi, Zach. Uh, nice to meet you, Wendy. Um, <laughs> I guess you know what? My itch actually started when I was in high school, and I was dating someone who was in the musical and I had very quickly realized that all of my other friends were also in the musical <laughs> and I got jealous is what happened. I got jealous, I felt left out and then I said, I'm going to join because, you know, I need something to do from 4 to 5 p.m. every day. But um, I guess my question was, what was a, if you're able to recall, like what was a moment that something went wrong, but you were able to bounce back from and how you feel like you, like how that bounce back was enabled. Cause I feel like sometimes that's a really difficult thing of like something kind of falters and then you don't know how to recover. You mean on stage yeah. or just in careers in general? I don't know. On stage. Um, hmm. Well, while I'm thinking of an actual example of when that happened, I will say this. there You're going to have times when you don't feel funny at all. You do not feel like going to the theater. You don't feel like getting on stage. But you got to get those 10,000 hours behind you, Mm. you know, and they're not always going to be stellar. Now, when I say 10,000 hours, you've heard that theory, right? Like if you want to get good at something, put in your 10,000 hours. Um, I still feel like I'm putting in mine, but (laughs) you still need to show up. You still need to put your game face on. And you still need to try because you've got scene partners up there who are relying on you. So if you don't feel like you can be funny that night, you sure as hell can help someone else be funny. You can make yourself the butt of the jokes for the night. Just at least be generous with with your talent in that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, so you're saying like if Cause you know, like you have those nights and you like, you're feeling hot, you're on fire, Yeah. but not everyone's night is the same night and not yes. every night back to back. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it just, it recognize when it's not yours and like, but still show up, you know what I mean? Like still, yeah, still cause up. someone else can't shine if there's no one else with them. That's it. Right. Right. So you can set them up for a joke. I hate to say that, not jokes, but you can set them up to have a good piece of information come out. You can always fall in love with someone. You can always start crying and make a huge admission. Mm. What I feel works well is if you, if you're on stage and you just don't know where to go with it, think of the last thing that was said to you and exhaust that 
premise. Exhaust whatever it is. Someone calls you a thief. You are the thiefiest thief that has ever thieved. <laughs> okay. You come from a long line of thieves. You were little Mr. Thief. You won the Mr. Thief pageant as a child. <laughs> like, exhausted. Really? Exhausted. And that will give either you or your scene partners something to chew on. And you can save things that way. Um, but yeah, that falling in love or, you know, ha having a big admission of something. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I got to tell you something right now. It's been weighing on my heart. Like those are ways you can save a scene. Hmm. That's a lot of really great advice for us to work with. And a lot of what we touched on in practice right before here of like, you know, giving each other, we gave each other the most stinky, terrible gifts here as uh, Scott Benjamin hosted. And we went ahead and had to accept them and just go with it and say, all right, you're right. This is mine. Thank you so much for this dead rat. I am going to cherish it forever. You know what? How how often do you have to play that card in life? Like, yeah, maybe it's not a dead rat, rat but it's an ugly sweater. Yeah. <laughs> a re gifted gift. Yeah. It's That's it. Great. That's a good exercise. And it's a good exercise in life because as we all have had a really rough year this year and like there you're right that you know coming together for something like this i told you has been the light of my life like you know i lost my mom in may of 2020 and come coming back to the summer here in new paltz and we all came together these people were there on a thursday in masks scared didn't know what to make of the world and we were in out in the outdoors creating these scenes and making each other laugh and it just I'm addicted to it now. It's like, I, it's a spiritual. And I, I guess I I'm kind that. of, I'm a mystical person with that. But I wanted to ask you if you feel, you know, like sort of a spiritual connection to the, to the act of improv, you know, channeling, you know, something and being in this bliss state, meditative almost to, to be able to perform it. And I, you know, that ego death it takes, I wonder what that was, had to look like for you to be, become so successful as you are in at improvisation. Well, that's interesting. You just said the words ego death. Yeah. And that's really very important. My best nights doing improv, if I, was, if I were to do a, a stage show or something, are nights when I was so nervous, I didn't know if I could push myself out there. And I, I didn't know if I could do it. I, I just didn't know if I would go to pieces and run off stage, which by the way, never goes away. And you better hope that feeling never goes away. That, that nervous feeling, because when you're nervous, you're invested. And when you're invested, you're gonna do a good job. That's such good and, advice, yeah. And then when you finish, it's like, the best drug you've ever been on. <laughs> the yeah. after show feeling is the best. And so one thing I do think of is that if you're going to do this, take it seriously. Because like you said, this is like, this has been like a balm for you, a medicine to help you heal. Mm -hmm. And everybody needs to heal from something. That's why we go and seek out comedy. So when you are lucky enough to get to do a show, doesn't matter where it is, doesn't matter if you're in your cul-de-sac or you know, in your living room or on a big stage, people have shown up, they want to be transported. So transport them. Mm. And you're lucky to get to do that. Yeah. So, and you still see it that way to this day, you know, it's like, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. It's like, you know, I think you are someone who's still working and you said you're still putting in your 10,000 hours. So it's, you know, you're still fine to like, there's this, you can never totally scratch the itch because it's not about us. It's about what you're saying, giving others the platform to be transported until art really can do that. And improv, especially 
it can be a very healing, you know, endeavor. I, I think that's a, a great way to put it. And, you know, we, we all come together and have just these amazing memories. And, and I think this was a question, um, f one of your questions, which was, what is like one of the all time favorite improv show, or it doesn't have to be a show, but a moment in time, first thing that comes to mind, where you just felt like, wow, this is what we do it for. This is why I do what I do. A few times I've been fortunate enough to go overseas and um, entertain the troops. Wow. Okay. So the last time I did that, it was New Year's Eve, 2011. And I think I had finished Bridesmaids, but it hadn't come out. And so people mostly knew me from other things. And I have to tell you that sometimes our shows were terrible. <laughs> they were terrible. But other times they were good, you know, and, but just having that feedback of these exhausted soldiers mm. in Iraq that wanted to come home. Okay. They were filthy. Sometimes <laughs> the water faces, sometimes it wasn't. Sometimes they had TVs. Sometimes they didn't. But to, get that feedback of like oh my god thank you for letting us forget everything for a little while that was like okay that i'm i'm very humble that i and then other times i mean i remember a time when i uh was doing press for a movie and they took me aside and threw me into a conference room full of bloggers didn't tell me this was going to happen and said, just lead this press conference. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, I was glad I had my improv pants on. That day. Yeah. Like, because what are you going to do? Stand in front of a room of people and say, you guys, they didn't tell me I was going to have to do this. Yeah. Um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> no one cares. No one cares. Yeah. Just get up and start doing something. <laughs> so, you know, that there's a time when I felt like I made it and another time where I felt like, thank God I had that life jacket. Yeah, that's so true. That's such a, a great point. And I, I definitely want to get some more of our, our cast introduced to this um, Hudson Valley group we have here. Is there some Cooper you'd like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Wendy. I'm Cooper. Thanks, for, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I, I guess I, I got started with the whole acting theater thing with um, a friend of mine and I would carpool to community college together and he had a uh, acting class that I wasn't enrolled in, but I had to wait while he was in that because he was my ride home. Uh, and eventually the teacher was like, hey, come on on stage. And, and I kept on going on stage every night, and then she started assigning me work and assigning me uh, <laughs> assigning me scene partners, and she started grading me, and I just I just kept on going back every every. Oh. Uh, and then the next semester, I took acting too, and then and, and here we are. Um, but I um, I wanted to ask when you um, create characters or you're on improvising characters, where where you find a balance between um, like stereotype, caricature, and archetype. You know, I mean, we all know stereotypes and, and you know, offensive or otherwise. Yeah. Um, but I just want to ask about your, your process in, in finding uh, a, a character that doesn't fall neatly into stereotypes. Well, I don't know that I've ever succeeded in that. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. You just, you just do what you can. I try to make, I try, I try to draw on people that are close to me mm. and take characteristics from them. However, as far as, you know, someone's always going to say that would never happen or that's a stereotype or that's so cliche. And it's like, and yet I've heard these words with my own ears. Like, I know this person and you're calling her a cliche. I don't know what to say about mm -hmm. that. But um, 
work work with the truth work with the truth and you can't worry about what other people are going to say about it you can you know you're always you always answer to a director mm -hmm. so at that point it becomes your director's opportunity to kind of mold and shape this and take it down or bring it up and in that way you you just have to be malleable you show up with the information you make your choices but someone should be there guiding this yes. now i've i've been in projects where you know you leave that to a director and turns out the director is terrible can't do <laughs> anything about that <laughs> you know there are certain there are certain movies that i will never speak about again <laughs> because I, I feel like, well, you really screwed me. <laughs> I did what you said and I trusted you and you really, you really uh, screwed me. But me? You know, yeah. that, all you can do is your best. Yeah, you know? your best is all you can do. Huh? <laughs> work, work from the truth, work from your truth. Yeah, yeah, that's such good advice, and I think we all, you know, have such great repertoire of characters to choose from just in our lives. And going deep, I think this is. We got some other characters here. Do you guys want to just introduce and ask a question and pass it on? Uh, hey, I'm I'm Tom. Nice to meet you, Wendy. Um, I'm actually new tonight. Hard to see you, Taylor. Um, I, I would say I guess I've always kind of had like a rocky relationship with acting, kind of like the ex you're not sure if you should call back or not because you're not sure if it's going to be good or bad. <laughs> yeah, you know you're going to do it at some point, for better or worse. Um, and I guess uh, I, I didn't really have a question prepared because I only figured out about this two hours ago, but I, I guess uh, if I, I had to ask a question, um, it, the, the longer I, I've thought about it over the years, the more it seems like acting and improv seems to have like external applications outside of the acting world. Um, what, are, what are some other types of like scenarios that you found that like having that improv skill set really helped you just, you know, not in an acting situation? Great question. Anytime I have to meet somebody because I am very shy and very socially awkward. But I can make other people feel important mm. Mm. by applying my improv skills. And then they think that I'm not as awkward as I am. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I have to go, oh, God help me if I have to travel by myself, okay? <laughs> I use my improv all day long. And when you think about it, we're all improvising all day yeah. long. But the people that I have found are the best at improvising are cops and lawyers. Mm. <laughs> I think we, should, we should pass the mic. Uh, we, have, we have a lawyer in the room. Thanks, though, Wendy. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll introduce you to our lawyer. I'm going to skip over because as a lawyer, I respectfully dissent uh, <laughs> to a degree. Uh, so, so I'm, as you can see, I, if I'm on the screen, I, I'm as old as dirt. And I came to this improv in sort of a roundabout way. Because when I was young and in college and in law school, I had done comedy. I had performed magic. I'd done all sorts of things like that. And if I had paid any attention to myself, that's what I would be doing. And by mistake, I ended up going to law school and I ended up becoming a lawyer. <clears throat> and when I was older, I said, you know, my wife actually said to me, you were supposed to be a clown. Go back and figure out how to do some comedy. And I started doing improv and I got very lucky with it. And I passed a lot of auditions and I got stuff. And uh, it, it's really been fun. But I think we do as lawyers have to improvise like in court because you don't know what the witness is going to say. And you have to mm -hmm. figure out how to roll with it, even when it doesn't go your way. Yeah. On the other hand, one of the, one of the distinct differences that I've noticed is that improv is all about yes. Yeah. And law is almost always all about no. Because if you're in a lawsuit, if the other side says grass is green, it's your job to say no, it's blue. <laughs> you know, so yeah. you, you that's why I find that my life is very schizoid in that way. Because during the days, I'm saying no a lot. And during the evenings, I'm saying yes a lot, which I find more fun. 
Um, mm. But but yes, so I, I, as as well, I think cops are actually better at it because I, I do some criminal law. They're really good interrogators, and they know how to ask a question that's going to draw somebody out and make the person feel comfortable. And the mm. cop, if they're good at it, can sort of pretend that they're the friend of the suspect. And, you know, you want to let out what just happened. You know, I, I understand what you're going through. Tell us how it was. And and they're very good at drawing that out. So I think. So actually, which is making me think, when you were sort of preparing for Reno 911, did you work with cops to try to understand how they were? I love that question because yes, I did. Not that it mattered. After a while, it was like, I'm just, I'm going on ride alongs just because I find this fascinating. Yeah. But, um, you know, I tried, I tried to like learn how to do a proper hold and, you know, how to enter a room with a gun and do all this stuff. Um, but it didn't matter in that show because we were so terrible at what we did. We were just like the worst of the worst. <laughs> but when I would go out on ride-alongs, you just reminded me of something. I went on a, on a stakeout one time, <laughs> a, a sting, a prostitution sting. <gasps> and I have never seen such masterful performances as the girls that were all hookered out and like waiting for these Johns to come get them. And they, I was listening to, you know, cause they were all wired and I'm listening to them. And in between, you know, drive ups, they're just talking about their kids and, Oh, you know, Halloween coming and I get a costume and blah, blah, blah. Guy would drive up, Hey, how much for X, Y, and Z. And then they, they would just turn into these like tough mamas. I, was, I wanted to hand out Oscars <laughs> and Emmys. These women were so brilliant. Wow. Wow. And um, well, I won't go any further with that. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was some really interesting undercover stuff that I saw. And dangerous. Dangerous. Yeah, it is. I like our profession more, <laughs> but I think you, you know, it's a. Uh, good for you for. I wanted to just say one more yeah. thing to our attorney here. Um, <laughs> good for you for getting back into it. And, you know, there is no such thing as too old to do anything. Like, that's something I just don't subscribe to. And, um, like, hey, you are never going to regret doing this. No, I, I've, it's been incredibly lucky, and yeah. uh, because I'm sort of weird in being in, infinitely older than everybody else I'm around, I have like firsthand memories of the Nixon administration. So, <laughs> you know, as, as, as a result of that, I end up, when I have friends who are putting on a play or filming a pilot or whatever, if they need the boss or the principal or the dad, I always get called in to do that. And because I have completely diminished expectations, it's always a surprise. So. <laughs> that's, that's, that's been nice. <laughs> well, there you go. I like that. Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. It's really great to have Scott here with us and just moved up from the city to the Hudson Valley. And we have another Hudson Valley actress who you might recognize from Paint, who is also a cast member. Oh, my goodness. It's good to see you again. Thank you. It's very good to see you. You made me laugh so hard. <laughs> you made me laugh so hard. I got a talking to about breaking. Oh, Whoa, trouble. you made a bird laugh on set. Yeah. I got thrown out of a meditation group one time because my best friend came with me and we were laughing so hard. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> just because, just the whole thing. We were just supposed to be so holy and so, like, so they're like in touch, you know. We just were holy. But I, and I do have to apologize because when I, I was, I was really scared. You know, you talked about that before. I was really scared, and you were so lovely and said to me afterwards that I made you laugh, and I and I was really emotional, and I said, "Oh, so you sure." Happy. And I think you thought I was snarky, but I wasn't. I really meant it. I was really, like, I was so so happy. But as long as we're talking about old people, 
I think I have a few years on this guy because <laughs> I, I am I am an older person, but um, uh, and I do kind of worry about being typecast as like you know the crazy old lady, you know that sort of thing. But I do feel, and this is for you because you're young, that there's so no, much. Not. <laughs> yeah, you are, and there's so 51. much. Fifty-one. Well, there's a baby. There's, there's, <laughs> there's, uh, there's stuff, you know, so much stuff going on for older women now, and I must say too that when I saw you in um, Reno nine one one, it was very validating as a, as a woman, as a as a as a female to have this beautiful blonde be so funny. And I'm not sure that had happened since Lucy. And it was so validating, you know, it was like like so enormously validating and wonderful. And I just love your work. And I just happened, this is completely accidental. I just happened to review on my Facebook page your scene with the traffic stop with the guy in make him do and he does musical comedy stuff, which is one of my favorite you don't make him do it. He does it. He does. It. He like walks the line, and it's, I am telling you, it just was very. It's just synchronicity. Honestly, honest, a hand to God. It's synchronicity. I had no idea, and it just is one of the things that makes me happiest in my life. It's just it's so brilliant. But anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I that that means the world to me. Thank you for those kind words. And just to speak to something you said about getting typecast, you're the one that has to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. Your agents or whoever, they're going to try to plug you in wherever they think you can work. Mm -hmm. But you're the one who can say, no, I've already done that. I don't want to keep doing it. Yeah. Or you're the one that can go into an audition and do it the way you think it ought to be done. And they can tell you yes or no. For you you are the one that can write stuff for yourself that showcases you the way you want to be seen. Yeah. You know, you can, you can take the wheel with a lot of that stuff. But just a word about auditioning to all of you, because this yeah. is something, this is, this is audition advice that totally changed my game. And uh, a friend of mine said, look, it's, it's a very successful actor. He said, you're going to go in to your auditions and it's a numbers game. So most of the time, you're not going to get what you're auditioning for, but they're going to remember you for something else because casting people are always scrambling to find people at the last minute. We wish they could do nationwide searches for every single role, but they can't, okay? You can still go in and do something the way you think it ought to be done. If they like you, they'll see if you can make an adjustment and you might get the part, but you'll most definitely get something further down the line. So show up and be good and think of it as, this is my free acting class for the day. Mm. But don't bring the weight of those expectations into the room with you because then you're going to skeeve everybody out. Everybody can sense that desperation. That's so true. Yeah. But you know if you're talented, right? You know you have every right to be there. And that's your time, your audition time. Nobody else's. Maybe it's five minutes, but that is yours. So you go in and show them how you would play this character. Mm. Damn. I love it. Yeah. Killing it. Oh, that's really good advice. It circles all the way back to the dessert plate again. And then we have Shady here. Shady. Hi, Wendy. I'm Shady. Hi. I came a little late. <laughs> no problem. So for me, I think I've been like on and off, like growing up, I've been in a couple of plays, like like not that big, just a little bit. And then like coming into college, I came in as a physics major actually. And like it didn't work out with COVID and everything. So I switched over to acting. Like it was my first semester, like that semester, this semester that passed, it was my first semester in acting. 
So I found out about this group. I came here. I was thinking like it was just a program. I'm gonna sit down and listen. I didn't know it was improv. So I right. came and I saw like a bunch of people just laughing and like joking around. Like I didn't know if I was in the right place or not. But, <laughs> 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 so I came in and uh, they told me what it was. So I liked it and it's been helping. Like it's been helping me like improve and it's helping me dealing with a lot of stuff. So. I enjoy. Good. I don't really have a lot of questions right now. Like um, I don't know what questions to ask. I just oh, like good. enjoy listening and like listening to the answers to the questions. It's been really helpful. So thank you. That's excellent. I love that you found this because um, you know I just I wish everybody in the world could do it in an improv class at least once. Mm-hmm. Me too. Yeah. Because I really feel like it's it's just it feeds your soul. It you does. Know, it's stuff, so, so many, so many things suck your soul. It's like, take yeah. away everything. <laughs> and then this exactly. is something, it does seem to like blow some wind in your sails. And yeah. I guess that's one question that this is a question from Margo, um, who uh, goes, they, them pronouns and is a nurse working in the hospital field right now. We love you, Margo. Um, and we, a few questions they had was one, how did you see improv change during the c pandemic? We all saw it go virtual, but I mean, how else do you think in this, how is it going to change from here on out going into this next chapter of the world? You know, that's interesting because I saw people get real creative yeah. with improv. And it just goes to show you, if you want to put on a show, then damn it, there is no excuse for you not to. Because there is Instagram Live, there's Facebook Live. You can record, you can have a Zoom session with everybody, record it and put it on YouTube. Like, you can entertain if you want to. Now, my sister has a theater in Portland. My sister, who's a family therapist, also has also runs a theater mm. i don't know how she does this but she does and they've been closed for a year and a half but they got creative and they started filming things everybody's got a phone you know you can film a monologue on a phone yeah um you can and and they patched it all together and you know Put it out there as a master class you know those master classes yeah. that, you know you can buy sessions for and whatever i saw i met i met no i know a guy that did uh, gary anthony williams you can follow him on instagram and he did a he did a series about um acting alone with people who are also acting alone mm -hmm. so he would film all of his lines, no matter what they were, they were just unrelated lines, sent it to someone else who would then fill in the blanks of what those answers mm. were. Um, and it ended up being a really interesting experiment and pretty funny. I participated in a couple of Brownlings live things where they, you know, it was an Instagram live and she would let you in the, in the room as it were and you would be in character and so it was like a surprise as to who she would be interviewing mm. um there's all kinds of things you can do so i think for improv you in the hudson valley can have a worldwide reach if you want it yeah let's do it guys that's awesome yeah. you so can right. have you can do virtual classes with people and in in studio classes like i think it's really made people get creative in the best way mm. that's awesome so there's no excuse not to put it out there yeah and i've also seen network showcases go virtual mm -hmm. so look into those those of you who are really serious about you know getting writing jobs and acting jobs, just do a search for different showcases, diversity showcases, um, network showcases, just 
find something and see if you qualify. Keep submitting yourselves. There's no reason that it shouldn't be you. That's so great. Yeah, I know we were not going to take too much more of your time. Just a couple more minutes, and I just have these other questions from from Margo. One was just that I these last two I think are really good for us to have a, you lead us into the next chapter, which is like what resources or tools do you recommend as young improv troupe? Do, should we check out? Um, and the follow up is, you know, who else should we be talking to if you? If you know, hopeful, hoping that maybe there's somebody. If if you know anyone in this area, we'd love to do something similar like this with any resources you may have. But both resources, books, you know, things, but also people that you think we might be interested in connecting with. Hmm. I feel like you know, with Netflix and all the streaming platforms. I mean, I hate to tell you to watch more television, but watch more television. There's lots of good stuff out there. Yeah. And watch at least like the evolution of how, um, of comedy and how you think we're on a road to being very PC right now. But that has not been a linear road, believe me. <laughs> yeah. Just, just go back and see how we've kind of, we really should be farther along, but like we were on a path and then we went backwards and then we mm. were on a path and then we went backwards again. Um, watch all the old classics. Yeah. You know? That's something we I've been thinking of us doing is, is improvising before a movie or an old classic and then we have a screening and, you know, watch a classic film together and discuss it. Yeah. But that's There's, great advice. There's some really good improv troops out there that you might want to check out. One is called The Black Version, um, headed up by Jordan Black. Cedric Yarbrough from Reno 911 is in mm. there. Um, they improvise. You, you throw them out a movie that actually existed, and then they do the Black version of what this movie <laughs> Okay. Really, really funny. Um, let's see, what else? As far as people that you could maybe talk to that might have some good info, do you remember Denny Dillon who was on paint? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, yeah. She lives in the Hudson Valley, so. Yeah, Denny was so has, amazing. Yeah. She has got a lot to say. She's an incredible lady. She she could teach you some stuff. Oh, she could teach you some stuff. She Absolutely. spoke very highly of you and talking with you. And yeah, improv legend, classic actress. We definitely will reach out to her. And yeah. and thank and, you. And an expert at like making her own stuff. Yeah. Uh, and a name for herself, you know, and, yeah. and characters for herself. Yeah, she's she's amazing. And and I, in closing, you know, the the one one thing I want to just say is that we. You have, I, I heard you talk so much about your your partner um, Greg and, and a lot, and I just was blown away. I'm I'm engaged at 24. I think I found my soulmate um, nice. in Serena, and you know, just having a partner who supports you in this realm. I heard you talk about how much that was helpful, but I'm wondering for all of us crazy, neurotic, improvising actors. How can we, you know, what should we know going into relationships of like how to be a successful with somebody who maybe isn't into that and how do they understand, you know, in what we're doing and what we're trying to, you know, go for? Wow, that's a lot. And I don't know if I can answer that. I can yeah. only tell you that I lucked out. You did. I, yeah. Because Greg just gets me. Find someone who gets Greg. you. I mean, find your Greg. And, and <laughs> Greg, no, I mean, listen, this is, he's banging around upstairs. This is someone that I used to have to put wigs on <laughs> so I could cut them. You know, like he worked two jobs at one point while I was going to the groundlings and buying stupid costumes all the time and props and this and that and paying for classes. Like, Listen, I don't know how to 
tell yeah. you to land someone that understanding, but I guess it's a great listen. word for all the other <laughs> all the other Gregs out there and people. Yeah. It's like support artists. You know, if you be, if yeah. someone believes in their dream, don't put your partner down. Because I just wanted to recognize that from everything I heard you say, you know, I I wanted to shout out Greg as just he sounds like an awesome partner and a great person. Yeah. 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 And, I, I think it's it's important for all of us to be that kind of support system for each other. And I, I really want to thank all these amazing people who came and got to meet you today. Like this, this group has just grown and gotten bigger and bigger. And we are working on our TV show of our own about coming together as a troupe. And That's it's, amazing. yeah, it's going to be a mockumentary, like retelling the story of how we got here. And all of your advice has been is so great and, and helpful to us and that journey. And, you know, if you want to just closing statement, whatever you feel like you want to say to us, we'll give you the floor and won't take any more of your time. But thank you from all of us. Thank you. Really. Well, listen, I, I have just had the best time talking to you guys today. And I'm thrilled at the journey that you're on. And I've, I've gotten to do a lot of fun things in my career and sometimes there's money and sometimes there's not, but the journey is the best. Even when you, even when you think, I don't know if I'm ever going to get anywhere doing this. Don't quit if you love it. If it makes your heart sing any of this, keep on going. You will never regret it. Just trust the process. You don't know what's around the corner. And if you lead with gratitude, stuff will come to you. Mm. All right. Wendy. Thank you so much, Wendy. I, from the bottom of my heart, you know, I can't believe how you know, gracious you were with your time and just to say, you know what, I will do this. I will say yes. Thank you, Thank you so much. It means the world to us. It really does. Lovely meeting you guys. Oh. Well, we have, we have so much more momentum. In closing, the last thing, will you give us a character, a setting, and a first line for us to make a sketch on our own? And that will we'll close it off. Just give us a, a world a character and a, di a, line, a line of dialogue, and, we'll, and that's, that's something we're going to do with every guest and uh, go ahead and make a sketch to go with this. Okay. Pet psychic. <laughs> Ross dress for less. <laughs> Your first line out. I didn't save my receipt. <laughs> love it. Thank you so much, Wendy. We, we love you. Thank you. Have a beautiful night. Thank you so, so much. <laughs> All right. Happy.